fuimos al primer lugar que pudimos. No había salida. Entonces dimos la vuelta alrededor y vimos que el carro de Jonathan había regresado. Entonces empezamos a correr y estábamos llorando y tocando puertas y nadie nos abría. Both females were living in a city filled full of poverty with an average income of $30 a month. They decided to take the job offer. Yo trabajaba como mesera. In a restaurant close to the city, I was a waitress. But a friend of mine, she told me about this trip to the United States. She told me, don't worry, everything is going to be paid for. And I know that I am going to have a better life for myself and for my children. They were smuggled through Mexico. Terrible, terrible smuggling experience. Put in the back of a truck with a group of male migrants locked into this truck where there was barely air, barely ventilation. They picked us up in Tallahassee and took us to the house. After we got into the car, he told us his name was Jonathan. We asked him how much the trip would cost us, and he said $16,000. They were very, very abruptly told that they were going to be working in prostitution to pay off that debt. One of the first things he did was take them shopping for the apparel of prostitution, took them at a local store. What was particular about this and unique at the time about this scheme was that it was the young women who were delivered to the clients, delivered to the John. So it was literally a delivery service. There were like six or seven more trailers where we were taken. In every trailer, if it was not one, then two or four or five. They had hurt me, but I was not bleeding. They had no idea that their documents would be taken from them or that they would literally be held captive. We decided that the first day, once we realized what was going on, we didn't want him close to us, to keep us under key, lock us. It was psychological coercion, the threat of what would happen to their families, and especially to their very, very small children, if they ever somehow escaped without paying off that debt. We spoke, and we decided to get out. We went to the first place we could, there was no exit, so we turned around and we saw the car. Jonathan had returned. So we started running, and we were crying, and we were knocking on all the doors, and nobody was opening, until finally a lady opened the door, and I fell to my knees and asked her to help me. We responded to a residential area near Raymond Deal and Capital Circle, which at first I didn't want to ask any questions. It's very obvious that they've been traumatized. The body language told me clearly they had been through a lot. So this took place almost 13 hours. She had me give them, each girl a piece of paper when they wanted to cooperate. And I said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, since you can't tell me too much about this house, can you at least draw an idea of where the house might be and then give me an idea? And therefore, when you start driving the neighborhood, you're like, oh, there's a cul-de-sac coming up. Let's see if she points that house out, it sure is anything. As soon as we started getting close, she goes, that's the house. The victims were taken to the Tallahassee Memorial Hospital where they were actually treated as rape victims. And it was the absolute right thing to do. That's when I got the call, was to actually go out to Tallahassee Memorial Hospital along with the Tallahassee police officers when the case was first identified. There were a number of us that were working to help represent um, some of the victims, but it meant all kinds of things. We decided that we were going to assist with the legal aspect of it, but at the same time, um, letting the, the clients know that we were here to assist on anything else that they needed, which at that point was to contact family members. They also wanted to, to go to church. Um, so we, we took them to church. The victims just needed some security. They were afraid that their their traffickers were going to find them. So we were very fortunate actually to, to have a safe place to keep them here um, in Tallahassee. The first time that I met 
um, uh, the, 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 the women. I was energized and charged to do something. I could say, uh, I am not going to make you do anything that you don't want to. Through the shelter, I could offer them a bed. A lot of the work that we did was really hearing their stories and figuring out how to apply for T visas. A trafficking visa. Congress created that specifically to take care of these young trafficking victims. Working with prosecutors and helping them understand what trafficking is and what it meant. We met with them on several occasions and uh, went over their testimony, attempted to keep them at ease and, and to prepare them for what is going to be a very uh, trying experience. Mr. Melkor himself, we charged him with a conspiracy count, and uh, it was actually an eight-count indictment is what he was charged with. He had a, had a defense that, yes, he was involved in prostitution, but had no knowledge about where the victims, the women, were coming from, why they were being held, or that they were being held, that they were having to pay back monies and, and, and you know, for the transportation and, and things of that nature. The defendant would never take the stand, uh, and the defense attorney would never allow the client to take the stand, so that the prosecutor was going to have to build the case entirely without any kind of testimony from the accused perpetrator. I began with uh, putting on the several witnesses that we uh, had in the case. The very, very first day of the trial, the Johns were brought in, that our law enforcement and prosecutors had identified a number of the young men who were the clients in this case. I was living with a group of friends. There was this card of this size, and he had a sign saying taxi, and a picture of a girl. That's what I remember. He would bring us a woman with which we would be able to have sex. Sometimes it was once, one time a week. Other times, two or three times a week. You have 15 minutes for $30, and if you're not done in 15 minutes, it will be another $30. The young women came in on day two of the trial. In a criminal case, uh, you, you have to have live testimony from the witnesses. And they had to do it in the courtroom with Melkor, Mr. Melkor, sitting there watching them. And um, again, that was just a, a lot of bravery shown on their part. Um, and I think that, uh, more than anything else, was was the strength of, of this case. El primer hombre con el que me acosté estaba completamente borracho. The first guy I had to please was intoxicated. Luché por contener mis lágrimas. He asked me Cuando if I was going to put a rubber on. I fought back tears as I began ripping Solo the plastic wrapper because I didn't know what to do. Otro, tras otro y tras otro. I just laid back Cuando and one after sexto, another they came in. Me vio con en los ojos y the me sixth preguntó, customer walked in and saw my tears. No te gusta lo que haces. He asked me, what's no. wrong? Don't you like yo what you're doing? I told no him, I don't want to do this. Y I'm not a prostitute. He said he was sorry, but he had to do this because he already paid his money and couldn't no get a refund. We would do the same thing. We would have sex with men, like ten. They took us like to ten places. I didn't like what I was doing. I was not feeling well. What we learned after going after Mr. Melkor is, is that was just sort of the uh, uh, popping open the lid. There was a much larger organization that Melkor was just a piece of or a lower member of. This was operating in half a dozen different cities that it stretched up into Atlanta, that of course there were Texas and we think California connections. It was organized crime at its best. Eventually Mr. Melkor decided to cooperate with the government and he did before his sentencing and provided information about Mr. Mansave and the organization. The Mansave organization, including Mr. Mansave himself, pled guilty.
Reflecting on the case, I still feel like the punishment isn't enough for what our clients have been through. Rescue is not one moment in time that the FBI or police may be able to rescue them from that brothel, and that's vitally important. But the idea being that, you know, that's just the beginning of the real rescue that they actually have to ultimately experience. I remember it as if it were yesterday, um, when the children arrived and how excited everyone was. They were at the airport and uh, one of them, the kids uh, were uh, running and I saw their lips moving and saying, is that mom, is that mom? It was uh, a good, um, it was a good feeling. Um, I, I said, good, you know, we, we, we did something. As a welcome, actually, uh, to Tallahassee and an introduction, I guess, to American culture, the mom actually picked Golden Corral to take the kids <laughs> that evening. And of course, they had a, a good bit share of, of sugar. It tends to really stabilize both the mother and the child to be reunited. My concern is how what we can do and how we can do it for them to actually um, overcome this horrible experience. So very, from the very beginning, give them the power. We continue even now, eight years later, to do the victim care for those victims. So for this particular case, community involvement was a major, major part. From the federal side, um, U.S. attorneys have been congressionally, congressionally mandated to address human trafficking and to build human trafficking task forces. To focus on intervening um, on the buying aspect of the buying and selling of sex and prostitution and trafficking. It seems small to maybe write a letter to your congressman, but if everyone, all their constituents are writing letters, then this is letting Washington know that this is something important. They'll have mouths to talk with, or, and even hands to write with, and computers to type with. I mean, we all have ways that we can build relationships with people and, and tell them about this, and you never know who you'll tell that'll spark enough of an interest to brew up a whole new passion for it. Uh, focusing on awareness and education, I think that uh, that is the only way that we can actually combat this kind of crime. Keep your eyes open to know what you're seeing, know who to talk to about it. Not to agree to live in a world where some people are just thought of as less than human. To never treat someone that way and never allow other people to treat someone that way. You know, I think the public most needs to understand what we learned here at the Human Rights Center is that you don't need to look to distant corners of the world for human rights violations. That they happen right here in our own backyard, right here in Florida, right here in Tallahassee, right here in the United States.